It's six o'clock. Um, we'd like to welcome everyone who has joined us um, for our virtual referendum meeting. My name is Kurt Wires, and I am the superintendent of schools. I am Tammy Nicholson. I'm the director of pupil services. Keith Lucius, the assistant superintendent. And so we again want to appreciate all of you for joining us this evening. Our goal is to provide all of you information regarding our referendum that's coming up on November 5th so that you can make an informed decision. Uh, we want you to ask questions. So please, as we're going along, don't wait till the end. If there's a question that you have as we are talking about that topic, uh, please put that question in the chat. We have some of our staff members monitoring that chat and they will let us know when those questions come up and we will try to answer them as quickly as possible. Again, we truly appreciate the support we've had over the years um for our our referendums um and um know that we are bringing an operational referendum to all of our voters on november 5th there are two different types of referendums there is a capital referendum and an operational referendum a capital referendum would be something where you get to see something shiny and new something that is an upgrade to possible one of our buildings um, like we did in 2020 um, in regards to both Pioneer and Cormier, or it could be a brand new um, shiny new uh, building that we would add on it to um, add to an existing school. An operational referendum, this is more reference used to pay for everyday costs like staff, uh, routine maintenance and utility bills. And so an example of the operational referendum um, if you look at our next slide, it will show you back in 2020, we actually passed two referendums, one operational referendum, which was a mental health referendum, and then one capital referendum, which I already mentioned about the upgrades to Cormier and Pioneer, as well as some gym floors at all schools and air conditioning. Then in 2023, we passed an operational referendum for 3.9 million for each year over the next five years. The referendum that's coming up now in November 5th is a renewal of the operational referendum that we passed in 2020. All right, we thought it was important as community votes to decide if the mental health operational referendum will continue. I think it's important to know that back in 2023, our school board made a commitment to uh, all of our residents that we would only levy the amount of money that we need in order to balance our budget. And so even though our residents were very gracious in passing an operational referen referendum for 3.9 million over the next five years, this past year, we didn't uh, levy the whole 3.9. In fact, we levied about $250,000 less than the 3.9. And our plan over the next several years is right around to levy about a million dollars less than the 3.9 or around 2.9 million instead of the 3.9 million. And Keith Lucius will get into more detail um, into that later in the presentation. So again, our board made the commitment. Um, and so that's why we're bringing it back to our voters um, in 2024 for our mental health referendum. So the referendum of 2020 added behavioral supports. Um, we know these supports are really important because we want to make sure kids are ready to learn. And when we have students who are struggling with um, not feeling connected, having anxiety, thoughts of suicide, it decreases instructional time. So we really wanted to add these behavioral supports to be able to increase the time kids can be in the classroom learning. We expanded supports in 2020 by adding three school counselors, two social workers, two behavioral specialists, two graduation specialists, and then we added some time to make a full-time at-risk position at the high school, and we added money to provide curriculum materials and training to all staff so we could build a community of um, learners throughout the district. So the school counselors have a variety of different roles of working with students. At the elementary level, um, they are working more with helping students um, regulate themselves. 
They work on interpersonal relationships, acquiring knowledge and skills to be able to um, work with other peers. They understand relationships. They work on um, achievement and career development as they get older. And there's employ employer um, or employee career management strategies that they learn along with life skills, learning um, about how to manage crisis, and they are involved in sm some small group counseling lessons along with a variety of other things that are listed here. Our school social workers empower families. They really are the connection between the community, the family, and the district. They support um, children's adjustment. Um, they really work hard with families to help the families feel connected to have kids ready to learn. They enhance communication among students, families, and schools. They build positive relationships and supports to improve school attendance and performance. They provide parent education workshops and training, crisis intervention. They screen students with mental health concerns. And they also coordinate a number of different services, including homelessness, foster care, mental health services, suicide prevention, and other community programs and resources. Our behavioral specialists um, work directly with the students within the school setting. Um, we have two behavioral specialists, one who works at Pioneer and one who works at a split position at Cormier and Valley View. They are consulting, instructing staff in development, implementation, and assessment of intervention plans. They really look at student data to see where student needs are. They may work directly with students, and they provide resources for staff to facilitate morning meetings. The graduation and at-risk specialists focus on our students in grades six through 12. They're really working on dropout prevention. They target more at-risk students who are struggling with behavior, with academics, and with attendance. They use a strength-based mentoring model called Check and Connect that really focuses on um, connecting with students throughout the school day to see how they're doing and to um, address any needs that they may have. During the 2023-24 school year, um, we have a number of different um, ways that these positions impacted students. 766 students met with a counselor or social worker to receive mental health supports. That is about 23% of our students in the district. We have just over 3,200 students here. 131 students were referred out for mental health services in the community. 29 middle school and high school students completed the Columbia Suicide Risk Assessment. That is an assessment that is a nationally normed assessment that um, indicates if students are having thoughts of suicide and if it's um, a low, medium, or high level threat. And then we refer out to community resources if it is to get supports. 18 elementary students completed that risk assessment. 47 students joined the HOPE Squad. This is a squad of students that is peer nominated. They are kids that students nominate because they feel like they are people that they would go to if they were in need. They don't feel comfortable sometimes talking with a parent or an adult, but they'll talk to a peer. And these peers are trained in ways to listen to these students and um, refer them for help so that we can get them the help that they need. 27 students worked with our graduation coaches at the middle school and high school, and then 60 students work with our at-risk instructors. Another data source we have is our Youth Risk Behavior Survey that is taken every two years in um, the middle school and high school. If you look at this chart, it shows you that um, in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we had students um, 47% of our student body were struggling with issues of anxiety. In 2021, that number went up to 54%. And now in 2023, it's at 48%, showing that we definitely still have students struggling with anxiety and a need for these mental health supports. Um, our self-reported depression was at 27% in 2019. Um, it's at 25% in 2023. Intentional self-harm, it's this is the students who have created a plan 
um, to hurt themselves. 16% of our kids in 2019 and 2023 are um, looking at that. Considered suicide, um, right around 14%. And then our food insecurities have has dropped from 25% in 2019 to 20% in 2020, 2023. And I think that's important because our number of students who um, struggle um, with getting food has been an issue in our district. And we've been able to address that through our food service program and a lot of community supports. The Panorama survey is a survey that we implemented in 2020 to start looking at students' um, social learning. And we look at that at tier one, which is the full classroom environment. And then we look at what the students need to work on at tiers two and tier three that's more intense intervention where they might need to be in groups with a counselor or a social worker or behavioral specialist. Um, it tracks classroom progress related to social learning and it tracks student progress related to some of the mental health interventions that they might get. The topics this survey covers are supportive relationships, positive feeling, self-management, social awareness, challenging feelings, and emotional regulation. Um, last year, our students who reported being able to regulate their emotions at school, our elementary students in grades three through five, about 55% of them felt like they could um, appropriately regulate their emotions. At the second secondary level, it was about half of our students. Um, students who reported feeling they're a valuable member of the school community, 72% at the elementary level and 54% at the secondary level. And students who believe they can succeed in achieving academic goals, we had 65% of our elementary students report that they felt they could do that and 50% of our secondary students. This is important to know because this shows us that at the universal level with all students, there is a level of need to be addressing um, these types of needs that students have so they're better able to be learning in the classroom environment. Um, staff response, um, we added a number of mental health positions that we've already added and we asked the staff if the added mental health supports have helped within the school environment and as you can see um, by the five buildings surveyed, um, the majority of staff at each of those buildings feel like students have better access to mental health services because of these added positions. Another thing that we've added at the elementary level for the last um, year is Character Strong. That's helping students build relationships within the building. We asked staff if they felt like it's helped um, their students build relationships. And again, the majority of staff felt like it did. These lessons are done in the morning. Um, teachers have a morning meeting where they meet with their students just to get the kids grounded for the day and to check in to see how they're doing. And then they have brief lessons on just what it's like to be a, um, a good friend and how to navigate um, dealing with emotions and a number of those things that are identified on the panorama screener. So our staff have really felt like it's helped with building relationships because we know that if we have positive relationships within the school setting, kids are better um, able to learn and we see less um, indication of bullying within the school. Another thing that we implemented in the last year was restorative practices. That's something that's also implemented with our morning meetings. And this is where staff um, work with students to learn positive ways to interact with the students um, and to help them understand how to interact with one another when conflict occurs and how to resolve that in a positive way. Overall, the staff response to our morning meetings and restorative practices, um, again, was um, highly successful. Um, we did have about 1% who disagreed and others who were unsure. So the logical question with the referendum is what is it going to cost uh, each individual taxpayer or each homeowner? So the proposed referendum is $950,000 annually for three years but we are renewing a 730,000. So the increase is 220,000 over what you've been paying already. So the estimated cost is $9 per $100,000 of value of a home. So a $200,000 house would pay about $18 per year.
when we look at comparing school tax burdens, equalized mill rates are the best way to compare districts across the state or to a state average. What you see in this chart is the Ashwaubenon School District mill rate and where we compare to the state average. So as you can see, the trend over the last 10 years is our mill rate has been going down steadily and we are well below the state average. Even the 23-24 year, which was the first year with this most recent referendum included, we're still below the state average and still following that trend. So how do we compare to area districts? This is this past fall's tax levy mill rate information. Ashwaubenon was the second lowest in the districts that we list here. So between De Pere, Green Bay, Howard Swamico, Pulaski, Seymour, West De Pere, we're, we're below all those. De Pere is the only one that's lower and De Pere passed a referendum this past year. So I expect theirs to climb closer to ours and they have a referendum also up for vote this November. So why is mill rate important? Because that helps you know what your tax burden is compared to other districts. That's the best way to compare the amount of taxes. So as I said, we were below state average and below most of our neighbors. We receive a lot of questions about open enrollment and the impact that has on our local taxpayers. We've used open enrollment to keep grade level groups to maintain a high school count of 1,000 to 1,200 students. That was a target that was set by the Long Range Planning Committee in the 2000s, which was a committee of residents and school administrators working together to try to set a long range plan or goals to make decisions. And open enrollment was a big topic during those meetings. We've used open enrollment to maintain that size high school because it allows us to maintain our current programs and options for students, things like uh, college credit classes and tech ed programs, things like that. We also looked at, during the committee, looked at research to show what was the optimal size for student engagement and those student opportunities and the committee determined that we wanted to target that 1,000 to 1,200 student size high school. So we use open enrollment students to fill in open seats to keep us on target to be in that range. Current open enrollment students make up about one third of our school district population. It's important to know, I get this question a lot, open enrollment does not impact our tax levy your levy would be the same if we had no open enrollment students at all. There's no impact on open enrollment on our levy. The open enrollment family pays property taxes in their resident district and their resident district pays tuition to the Ashwaubenon School District for that student. So there's no impact to a taxpayer. As I mentioned, we've used those open enrollment students to fill open seats in grades one through 12. So we don't add staff when we add students for open enrollment, we're filling open seats in an existing classroom. We do accept more students in 4K and kindergarten that sets us up for that targeted 1,000 student to 1,200 student high school. So we try to keep our grade level groups in that range. So we're tracking to keep our high school full and the operator buildings near capacity. Total tax levy history. So we get a lot of questions about what's happened with individual homeowners taxes and how it's gone up. So I created a 10 year chart here that shows uh, where, we, where we have total dollar tax levy. So total dollars that as a district we have raised in 2014-15, we raised just over $19 million through taxes. For 23-24 this year that we just completed, we raised 18,390,000. So almost $800,000 less than what we did 10 years ago. And as you look through the trend, you can see that it moves around from year to year, but we've been trending down for several years until we had the most recent referendum. So you'll see a bump back up in the 23-24 year. That's tied to the $3.9 million referendum that the community supported. So when you look at mill rates, which as I said earlier, is the best way to look at how, how to compare school districts, in 2014-15, our mill rate was just over $10. For this past year, we were just under $7. So that's a 30% or over a 30% decrease in our mill rate or the tax burden on the local taxpayer. But I get questions all the time. How can our mill rate go down, but my personal taxes on my property have gone up? So I tried to take this a step further. And there's a lot of numbers on this page, but I'll try to walk you through it. So the first four columns are what we just looked at on the previous slides. The middle column, average property value increase. 
This is the total property value in the district. We get this number from the state. This is the percentage increase that we see in the property value each year. So then the column next to it where it says sample house, we started with a $200,000 house in 2014-15. Use that property value increase to show how an average home would increase in value from 2014-15 through current. And that $200,000 house would now be valued at $277,000, almost $278,000. So we use that then with the mill rate to calculate an estimated property tax. So you can see that home at, valued at $200,000 would pay $2,011 in taxes in 2014-15. In 2023-24, they would pay just under $2,000. They'd pay $1,932 in taxes. So in effect, that homeowner, if they've done nothing, are, they're paying less taxes than what they paid 10 years ago. <clears throat> but when you look at your tax bill compared to last year, as you can see in the bottom two rows, last year that home calculated out to $1,594 in taxes. So you do have a significant increase one year and that's related directly to the referendum that was passed last year. It was a 21% increase in what the average homeowner is paying. This does not take into account the reassessment in the village. That just changes how the taxes are spread. So different houses were reassessed at different increases. That, that's handled by the village, but the total dollars raised are the column on the left total levy, the $18,390,000. That, that, that number is how much we raised. So how the assessment happens just spreads that out a little differently as some houses were assessed at a high, larger increase than others. So Superintendent Wires mentioned that with the last referendum, we made, the, we made a commitment to the community that we would use what we needed to keep up with inflation. And if the state gave us increases in school finance, we would reduce the amount that we were using for that referendum. So when we calculated that referendum based on the years of high inflation where the state gave us no increase in school funding, we needed $4.9 million a year to keep pace with inflation. When we surveyed the community, the community support wasn't there for the $4.9 million, and there was more community support for 3.9. So we decided to reduce what we asked and felt confident the state would step up and give us a, make up at least that million dollar shortfall. Well, they did, and they did a little bit more than that. So this past year, we underutilized our revenue limit authority by $256,000. And for this coming year, where we're going to set the levy at the end of October, we're projecting that we're going to underutilize that levy by 981,000. So in effect, instead of a $3.9 million referendum, we're closer to a $2.9 million referendum. And that $981,000 underutilization will be carried over for the next three years as well until, this, that, re until that referendum expires. And then we will readdress that. So the question has been asked, what happens if the referendum fails and what will that look like um, for our buildings as far as our mental health supports? So at Cormier, um, we will have a half-time behavioral specialist and a full-time counselor um, that we currently have would not be employed. Pioneer will lose a full-time behavioral specialist. Valley View will lose a full-time counselor a half-time behavioral specialist and a half-time social worker. Parkview will lose a full-time graduation specialist, a full-time counselor, and a half-time social worker. And the high school will lose two full-time graduation specialists um, and at-risk teachers along with a half-time social worker. So here are just some current ratios that we have. Our current staffing at each building for counselors is listed on the left. If the 2024 referendum fails, you can see what our ratio would be with students um, to the current counseling positions that would be there. On this slide, it shows our social workers. The state recommended ratio is 250 students to one social worker. Our current staffing for social work is on the left. If the 2024 referendum fails, you can see um, that we would 
have fewer services, social work services for our students at the um, each grade level as well. If you have additional questions about the referendum, um, our contact information is listed there and you are welcome to reach out to us. We are willing to come on site if you have any on-site um, needs or groups that you would like us to speak to, we are very um, willing to come out and speak to groups as well. Yeah, please do not hesitate to call, email us, set up an appointment. We are willing uh, to make the connections and to answer any questions that you may have.